All right, Adam, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. Let me bring this up. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for commandeering your Thursday night, um, but we wanted to try to encourage more seat time at our school. So we're kind of trying this out for this first year. Um, and of course, we'll welcome feedback after the meeting. But again, uh, welcome. My name is Adam Shalakowski. I've been autocrossing for Oh, it seems like eternity at this point. So I'm, I'm happy to try to walk you through some uh, some pointers and tips that we feel is very important as you start your autocross journey. All right, so a little bit about me. I started back in 2002, so that's what, 21 years ago now. Uh, I've raced with both the BMW Car Club, which is the group we're currently in. Uh, for most of us, I think the other half is which club? Is it Mini Cooper, Frazier? Yep, uh, as well as SCCA. Um, I've instructed since 2005, so I've been doing that for, for many, many years. I've won in different classes, so I've won with stock cars, I've won with heavily modified cars, I've won with cars that aren't my own car. Um, I've been involved with the committee since 2004, um, so we've kind of rotated membership there for a long time, and it's changed over the years, uh, and I guess the layout now is, it's a welcome change, it's a little more uh, laid back and fun, I'll say that. So what is autocross? Um, Really, it's just a structured control environment that we get to play with our cars in. Um, we try to set it up where obviously you're racing a clock as opposed to other vehicles. Um, and what you're going to see is really a sea of cones, right? So when you first come out there, it's going to be very intimidating because there's a lot of things that are out there that kind of catch your attention. But at the end of the day, it's really supposed to be a fun event. Um, it's a social gathering. I mean, we make friends. I've known Fraser for God knows how long now. Um, and a lot of the other members I've known for over two decades. So hopefully you'll have a similar experience to us where it's really a fun place to go learn more about your car um, and really uh, put your car through the paces. So before you drive, it's important that you kind of get set up. Um, we typically have a very as comfortable driving position if you're going to and from work. It's more relaxed, you know, for longer drives. Uh, but when you're actually in a car for racing, you do want to make a couple adjustments. Um, I believe nowadays they teach not nine and three hand positions. So that's typically something you'll see uh, race car drivers try to do for a little more control. You want to try to sit upright. Uh, you also want to make sure your seat height and distance from the wheel is a little bit different. Um, if you look at the image on the right here, it kind of gives you some general pointers. Again, the angles, there can be some variations due to your height, you know, whatever your physical dimensions may be. Um, at the end of the day, it's really a very personal feeling for how you should set up yourself. Um, but in all situations, you want to minimize your movement. So if you see here on the left, there's a seatbelt trick. Um, what you can do is you basically put your seatbelt in and you pull it so it locks. Um, and then you try to move your seat forward into whatever position you think is appropriate for your distance from the steering wheel. And what that does is since the seatbelt's locked, you'll actually kind of get pushed into it and then it cinches you in place and you're not really able to move. So this is of course kind of the, the cheap option. If you happen to have a harness, um, you can do it differently with that obviously. But if you just have a regular seatbelt, that's a great uh, solution. And if you're not really sure about what I'm talking about, we can run you through it uh, this weekend. And the last thing is helmet check. So the helmet adds several inches to the your top of your head. So if you're very tall or if you have a long kind of upper torso, Sometimes some people actually hit the ceiling of their cars. So you'll be mindful of that as well when you're trying to get adjusted in your seat. Cones, I mentioned this already. Uh, Adam, yep. I, I need to jump in. Um, can we just check the waiting room real quick between these two slides, see if anyone's in there? Yeah, um, if I can move my mouse on top of it. So my selections are, are, I have waiting room so I can admit. I hope I'm clicking admit, not remove. Joining. All right, thanks, sorry for the interruption. No worries. Yeah, I just wish I had a, a cursor so I could see what I was actually clicking on. Testing audio. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Cool. 
joining by browser, so I had no idea if this would work. Oh, God. This is so much fun, Fraser. I have no cursor trying to click on buttons. Bear with me, folks. I think I got everybody. Okay. First, do you want to go through a brief intro or just have them catch up later? I think we'll just catch up later because we're recording. So, okay, great. All right. Um, let's see. Let me get rid of the participant screen, hopefully. There we go. All right. So, cones, as I mentioned earlier, uh, once you kind of pull up to the course, uh, you really just see a, a large sea of cones. It can be very, very intimidating for your first time. Um, or even if you're a, a seasoned pro. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're going to walk the course. So you have an opportunity to kind of figure out roughly where you're supposed to go, uh, which will try to alleviate some of those kind of concerns you may have. Um, really with cones, they're your boundaries, right? So when you're driving through the course, it's not so much that you can go wherever you want to. There's going to be uh, cones lying a certain way, pointing you in certain directions to try to help you get you through the course as quickly as possible. Um, and of course, since this is your first time, always ask questions if you're kind of unsure of where you're supposed to go. Um, but as it is the school, we'll really take it slow and help you guys through the process because it can be very intimidating. If you manage to hit a cone during your runs, um, sometimes uh, it's inevitable. You just make a mistake and you run over a whole bunch. Don't worry about it. Um, it happens to everyone, but it is important to understand what happens when you do hit a cone. So the images in the bottom right tell you, you know, some of the potential situations you may see with a cone. So if the cone's standing up inside the box, there's no penalty. If the cone's standing up and it's touching any part of the box that it's in, there's also no penalty. If it happens to be standing up, but it's not 10 feet away from where it's supposed to be, there's no box there, that would be a penalty. Um, if it's lying down, whether it's in the box, out of the box, wherever it happens to be, that's always going to be a penalty. Um, oftentimes you'll see a cone stuck in a wheel well, like in the image in the bottom right. Um, you'll sometimes drag it through the entire course. Uh, don't worry about it. You don't have to come to a complete stop while you're coming through. What you want to do is once you're through the finish, um, someone at the end should kind of help you and say, hey, stop or in reverse. And that'll actually help get the cone out and we'll kind of pull it out and then reset the, the cone or the course workers to reset the cone. Uh, so never worry about that. Course workers. Um, what do they do? So while half of the people are driving the event, the other half in that heat are responsible for working the course. They're going to help keep the event moving because we need people to shag the cones. So when people hit them, we need them to uh, replace them um, quickly and safely. So one of the things that I think we've noticed over the years is people tend to watch the cars, but not necessarily the cones when they're working the course. So it's very important that you keep your eyes on the cones as opposed to the cars as they're coming through. Having said that, it doesn't mean you're just focusing on the cones and then a car that may be coming towards you, you ignore. So there is kind of some common sense that goes uh, along with what I just said. Penalties, another course worker responsibility is calling penalties. So each station will have typically two people or more. Uh, so one radio uh, will be there as well. And you wanna call in penalties with the car number to make sure that we can allocate that cone to the appropriate vehicle. Course awareness. Always keep your eyes up. So if you happen to be taking pictures, if you're on a phone or whatever, put that away because we want to make sure that you're safe and you can't do that if you're looking at something else. At the course stations, we're also going to have red flags and extinguishers. The red flag should only be used um, in an actual emergency situation. Sometimes people kind of wave it when maybe a car might spin or maybe they hit a cone. That's not always appropriate. 
if they happen to spin and stall and there's a car coming behind them and it looks like that could be a dangerous situation, of course, use the red flag uh, in that scenario. Um, with the red flag, you always want to keep it furled in your hand so you don't want to have it loose uh, because in the wind, it can actually kind of you know blow open. And then drivers may actually see that, that flag and think that they're, they're being red flag when they're actually not. We'll also have extinguishers out on the track. Um, they're very simple to use. Hopefully people have used them in the past, but even if you haven't, the acronym PASS, pull in, squeeze and sweep kind of gets you through. Uh, so you're gonna pull the pin, uh, you're gonna aim at whatever happens to be on fire, squeeze the trigger or else something comes out and you're sweeping to get good coverage or whatever happens to be on fire. Haven't had that real need, um, but it is something that we like to have handy. Going back to the flag for a second, um, if you are a Formula One fan, you probably saw it was it Bill Gates or whoever tried to wave the finish flag and it was very poorly done. You want to make really large circles so it's very, very obvious uh, that there's a problem because uh, it's important that you get that driver's attention. You don't want to jump in front of the car because that's obviously dangerous, um, but you can, you know, scream a little bit and, and make it pretty obvious, you know, that there's something they need to come to a complete stop for. Any questions before we move on? All right. We'll, of course, have an opportunity at the end for, for questions as well. All right, so going through course elements now. So if you remember, you know, we, we described the course as a sea of cones. So the image on the right is kind of an example of a very, very short course, uh, but with different elements. Um, so you'll have these things called pointer cones, a gate, You'll see a slalom, sometimes you'll see like a Chicago box or something like it's a 90 degree thing. Um, all of these things are considered elements and they're used to basically piece a course together. Different cars will handle these elements differently. So if you have a very, very light, small car like a Miata, you can handle certain elements easier than other longer vehicles. Um, it's important that you understand kind of what the cones are telling you to do. You know, so when you enter a slalom, some slaloms allow you to enter one direction or you can enter it from either direction. And then through our course walks is when you'll actually be able to understand which direction is actually gonna be faster if you do have, in fact have the option. And things like that'll be explained during the course walk, uh, which will happen before you know, your runs. Um, and each course walk will vary or differ based on the track because we actually change the courses at pretty much every event. Vehicle dynamics and autocross. So a lot of autocrosses feel um, the way I've always kind of, you know, taught driving is really about you feel through your seat or your butt, right? So you really understand and, and kind of get that feedback through your, basically what you're sitting in. Um, a lot of other kind of sensations you may experience when you are across will be understeer, oversteer, as well as traction situations. So understeer, it's really just a lack of front end grip. Um, so this is very common in kind of, I guess, well, I'll say it's common in daily driving, um, but basically if you're wanting to turn right, but then your car doesn't turn right and you're going straight, that's understeer. Um, what can happen is basically you're just trying to carry too much speed, which means slowing down is going to be important. Um, how you can improve understeer is obviously uh, by lifting or slowing the vehicle down, as well as smoother inputs. If you're very, very abrupt uh, with your steering inputs, you can basically kind of outdrive your tires, and then you're just going to go in a straight line as well. Um, generally speaking, cars are designed to understeer before they oversteer, just because it's generally a safer thing to have happen than you spinning around um, if the rear goes out. Oversteer uh, causes too much throttle. So you can just mash a high horsepower car and you notice the car just kind of goes around in a circle. Um, if you break in turns, you're asking the car to do several different things. You can also basically, you're unloading the rear tires if you're braking. So basically your weight's gonna travel towards the front tire. So you have more grip there, but then you have not as much grip in the back and you're basically gonna cause some sort of pendulum effect on the back of the car. Um, same thing if you lift in a sweeper. So if you're going around some sort of sweeper, so like a long left-handed turn, um, and then on, you lift all of a sudden, it's the same kind of effect as braking, where now the weight of the car is shifting forwards and you're gonna lose that rear grip and that can cause some oversteer. Oversteer is fun, um, but it is slow. So during autocross, it's something you also want to try to avoid as best you can. Um, in certain situations, it can be helpful to try to turn or aim the car in a better direction than you happen to be in, um, in a real drive car anyway. But again, that's more of an advanced maneuver, uh, but it's good and 
I guess it's a good to just be aware that there's different ways to kind of understeer and oversteer to your advantage in certain situations based on your car. Um, how can you improve oversteer? The biggest thing that people tend to do here uh, incorrectly is they turn in the direction that they kind of want it to go as opposed to counter steering. So initially it's very, very counterintuitive. So if you're turning left and the, step, uh, the rear of the car steps out, you actually, so imagine the car is going left, the butt of the car is going to the right, you actually wanna turn into the direction of your slide. So you wanna turn the wheels to the right. Um, and the counter steer thing has to be pretty quick um, and you don't wanna do too much or too little cause you're not gonna be able to save the, the rotation of the vehicle if you do either of those. And it's very much a feeling thing and understanding I get, bless you, uh, how much the angle of the car uh, is really uh, need to be countered by the, the steering input. Any kind of questions on understeer versus oversteer? Um, I tried to give you guys the pictures so you can kind of see what the wheels are doing and, and talk you through it, but it's not always obvious uh, via slides. It looks like I have two more people in the waiting room. All right, looks like I picked those two people up. All right, no questions, I'll keep moving on. All right, so available traction. Um, so this is a fun slide for me because uh, it's really about physics. Um, there's this thing called the friction circle. Uh, and what it really is, it's, it's kind of like an allocation or a budget to allow you to either accelerate, brake, or turn. Um, depending upon what you're trying to do, Right, if you need to stop before you enter a gate, if you're turning by a gate, you're going to take away from whatever that budget is. So, if you imagine you have 100% available traction and you're trying to do two different things, you're basically splitting your budget. So, if you can imagine if you're splitting a budget, it means you're not going to be as efficient if you only did one of those things. So, if you exceed the budget or don't use enough of it, you know, it's kind of a negative thing. Um, if you exceed it, you're going to have a car that's going to be sliding or losing control of the vehicle. And if you don't use enough of it, it just means you can go, you know, really have gone a lot faster through whatever, you know, course element you were trying to go through. Um, this whole kind of concept of friction is really important because when you move from surface to surface, there are some tarmacs that have more inherent stickiness to them than others. Maybe there's more grit. Um, I think it, let's see, I can't remember if it's Jefferson or which part of the circuit or the triple skid pad. There's a spot where it's actually very, very slick. So the friction is very low compared to other parts of the circuit. So it's important that you're able to quickly judge that as you're moving around a course. Um, if it starts to rain, obviously the friction is going to go down as well. So these are all considerations you want to make and understand uh, as you're going through a course. Questions on the friction circle. So this one's actually really, really important to understand. Um, there are definitely times where you're going to be doing two things at the same time, but just understand that there's a risk to doing that. When you mention two things at the same time, it's like accelerating and braking at the same time kind of approach? So accelerate and turn or braking and turning typically. Okay. Um, yeah, accelerating and braking at the same time generally wouldn't happen unless you have a turbo car, but that's like a super advanced concept. Um, but yeah, think about if you're making a left turn. Um, and if you're trying to accelerate through it, if you're already going at whatever speed you can make that left turn to say, if you're just going through without accelerating, you'd be able to hold that turn at a higher speed if you're trying to accelerate through it at the same time. Does that clarify for you? I'm sure uh, I'll have more questions come Sunday. But yeah, oh, I give you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, no, yes. I, I, like if I'm going through it, if I overdo it, then I probably mess up the, 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 the trail I was going for or what I was approaching to do. Yeah. I mean, I guess a good example, if you think about it, we're going to have a skid pad over the weekend. Um, so let's say you're going in a circle, right. And now you're, you're holding that, that circle. You're not, the circle's not getting bigger in diameter, right. 
Um, and if you slowly give it gas, at a certain point, you're not going to be able to hold that diameter of circle anymore because you don't have the grip, right? So now all of a sudden that circle is going to get much wider, much wider until, you know, maybe you can hold it if you stop accelerating. So that's kind of a good way to think about it. You know, if you go slower, you're going to kind of make that circle a little bit tighter. Um, so that's that whole concept of that friction circle and understanding that there's a budget and you basically you're exceeding it if you're making that circle bigger and bigger, if that makes sense in your heads. Good questions. P please ask questions. You know, we're here to, to help and try to provide some guidance and some insight into this before you kind of step into the car. Um, so if there's anything that's not clear or anything at all, please uh, speak up. So, so does that mean that like you slow down before you get to a curve so that you can sell it, accelerate to it once you get into it? It largely depends on the element. So if you can safely handle the speed and carry it through that section, you don't necessarily need to. But if you're coming up to a very tight turn, let's say, where you need to slow down, then yeah, you're going to have to slow down before it. And a lot of that comes through understanding what your car is capable of. Um, and that's really where I feel a lot of time gets lost is where people either, you know, break too much so they don't carry enough speed through a section or they break too late and now they're having to go extremely slowly through a section and then try to make up for it later. Um, so there'll be a, a section that's coming up about, I think, apexes, which is somewhat related to your question. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's a very element-specific answer. So I can't give you a concrete one, unfortunately, but it'll make more sense once you step into the car. Thank you. Sure. Ah, here we go. Apex. All right. So, um, so the two images on kind of the top give you a, a visual on what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and this whole concept of a racing line or apex is really how uh, professional race car drivers are able to drive through like a course or a circuit or whatever very quickly. Um, typically, there's going to be only one or two correct racing lines, and it's up to us to be able to identify that as quickly as possible. Because as an autocrosser, our courses change every time, right? If you think about a track, tracks are very static, typically, right? They're not really going to change from year to year. Um, your braking zones, your braking zones, you know, where you turn in, it's very, very similar. Um, but in autocross, we can move things around weekend to weekend, day to day, um, and it becomes a much more uh, difficult exercise to understand where those breaking points are, when you're supposed to turn in, or how you're supposed to attack a specific element. So starting with the image on the left, this kind of green line you'll see, it looks very, I guess, long. Um, and what it's trying to do here is, is allow to open up the turns and carry speed. The red line, even though it's shorter, you're, you're kind of doing what I would call pinching the turns. And that means you're not able to really carry as much speed through the section. So that kind of goes to your question a little bit earlier, um, like, or how much should I be braking or can I accelerate through the turn? So by taking the green line here initially for that first turn, by coming out wider, it allows you to A, carry more speed, and B, get on the throttle faster between the elements of the course um, versus the red line. You have to kind of come up to the cone, then that really sharp right turn, you have to really hit your brakes hard and heavy uh, in order to make it. And then you're quickly accelerating to the next cone, then you're having to hit the brakes again. And you can kind of see it's not really smooth. It's more abrupt even though it's shorter. So the concept here is really understanding that smooth is fast and you wanna to try to open up the turns when it makes sense. The right image here uh, is the, I guess, a great image about an apex. So the green line um, is kind of a average or typical, uh, I guess, apex. And then you can have like a later turn in, which would be that yellow guy. And then the red would be that kind of pinching turn. Um, and depending upon the angles, you know, the green or the yellows can be good. In general, the green one's going to be the best in this situation because of the 90 degree angle. Um, again, it's a very angle specific kind of, uh, I guess, very, depending upon the angle of the turn, your apex is going to change. So if you imagine that this was now a more of like a 270 degree turn, so you're kind of coming back down towards almost like a U-turn it's going to be a much later apex. If it was something that it wasn't as much of a right turn, but it was kind of more of a sweeping right-hander, you'd actually be okay following the red line. So it's important that you understand that distinction uh, as you're going through our course elements, and it'll be something that your instructors will work with you over the weekend.
All right, miscellaneous tips and tricks. So one of the first things I also mentioned to people is look as far ahead as you can. Um, it's very simple to get lost in the sea of cones, but the most important thing is to really look farther ahead because if you're looking at the cones you're passing, you're not really understanding what's coming up and where or how you need to set up the car. Um, so if you go back a slide a second ago, it made a mention of, well, what happens next, right? So if you take this right-handed turn, well, are you actually considering and trying to set up the vehicle for what happens after that and after that? Because it isn't just making, you know, one turn, it's linking a lot of these turns together, which is how you're going to be able to make uh, your times drop. If you messed up, um, so let's say you completely blew a turn or you're spinning two feet in. So if you have a clutch, that's why it's two feet in. And just come to you know, a complete side as quick as you can and kind of get your bearings and continue on. Um, if you do do that, don't just kind of sit there and, and stop and don't do anything because we typically run multiple vehicles on course. So just get your bearings quickly um, and then continue on as best you can. I didn't understand what you meant by two feet in with a clutch. Yeah, so your brake and clutch. What does two feet in mean? So you're you're putting your two feet on the brake and the clutch. So you're basically putting it in neutral with your clutch and then you're braking hard to get the car to stop and regain control of the vehicle. Four inches, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, and if I'm not clear, please speak up. All right, next one is look to your out. So one of the things we've noticed over the years is people, when they panic, they tend to look to where they are going to put the vehicle, which is oftentimes a pole. So if they see a pole, they're kind of freaking out about it. Um, and then they just see it and they drive right into it. Look to where you want to go, not to what you want to try and avoid. Okay. Um, it's, it's a very simple exercise and it's actually something that's helpful for just regular street driving as well. Um, you never want to look at what you want to avoid. Very, very important. Um, grass is bad. So if you end up on the grass, you want to straighten your wheels. Don't try to keep turning and keep turning because your wheels are allowed to dig into the grass. If it's soft enough and then you can roll the vehicle. That's a problem. Um, slow and fast out. So if you remember from the previous slides, you want to try to go slower into a turn and fast out if you can, based on the apex. And again, that's 100% dependent upon what type of uh, course element you're actually encountering at that moment. The shortest distance is typically fastest. So if I had a side-by-side -side comparison of someone who took very similar lines, but let's say one person was one inch from hitting the cone, and another person was one foot from hitting that cone, the person that was actually closer to the cone is going to be faster. So a lot of this, uh, I guess, concept is really about driving precision and understanding that if you can go from point A to point B in the shortest distance, you're going to gain time that way. All right. Um, I guess this is pretty much the end of my content. I'll let Fraser kind of close with any comments. Um, but we'd like to open the floor up to any questions, comments, concerns, um, things you're worried about, scared of, or excited to see uh, this coming weekend. You guys are a quiet group. <laughs> Something in chat. Hold on, so I can pull it up. I apologize. I'm on a Mac, and I don't know how to use it, and I don't have a cursor trying to click through these things. You want us to ask questions now, or did you want somebody else to speak first? Either or. You, if you have a question, shoot. Well, I, I unfortunately missed the beginning of this because I was in another Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do. We'll send out slot the slide deck. So if you missed, you know what, you probably missed the only four or five slides. Um, but you'll be, uh, be able to have a chance to kind of review them. And if you have questions about anything specifically on them, just bring it to some of the instructors over the weekend. We'll help you. You don't have an instruction here, right? Uh, I, if you don't know anything about autocross and they'll be giving you something there. I'm having trouble hearing you. Is someone else not on mute? Eugene, can you mute there? There we go. Thanks. I, I said, I have never done this before. I never really even heard of it before. So what yeah. you've talked about so far from slides four on is a little bit over my head. Are you going to be giving instruction there? To yes. Yeah, 100%. So it's not like we're just going to feed you to the wolves or anything like that. 
Um, we try to design the schools with everyone in mind from people in your situation to some people with more experience. So we'll have instructors available to sit with you and ride with you uh, to really explain what we're supposed to do. And then what we do in the schools is also, it isn't that you just jump into a full course, it's going to be stations kind of broken down into very small sections, which are kind of, it's easier to kind of, you know, bite off, you know, than the full thing. So there's a little less pressure, there's no timing associated with running those individual exercises, and it's really just learning, you know, what your car can do and what you're comfortable with. Um, and don't feel like you have to, you know, be amazing or be a pro, you know, you don't need to compare yourself to other people and other people with different experiences. It's really just about you coming out and learning something new, uh, and we'll be there to help for sure. So I won't be holding other people back by being... No, not at all. Thank you. Yeah, don't worry about that at all. So we've had very beginner drivers, even like they just got their license kind of thing. So I'm sure it'll be, you'll be fine. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, choose our number. Yeah. So typically uh, we can choose our numbers for the year, but I'll let Frazier kind of tackle that one if he wants to. Sure. So question in the chat was, can we choose our own number for normal events? Yes. When you're doing registration, you're clicking through, you're picking your number. So if you've got a number that's your favorite, we can get it on the car. For the purposes of this school, um, if you have a number request, if you have numbers, someone's loaning you a set or something like that, feel free to email me and we'll make sure we get you the numbers that you want. Um, if not, we're just going to assign numbers um, for the uh, purposes of the school since it's a standalone event. And then there was another question about what do you mean choose a number? So for this school, we didn't have anyone choose numbers, but in a normal um, event, we are timing everyone. So when you pull up to the line, we need some way to keep track of all the run times and everything so we aren't confused and keeping track of every single thing standalone. Um, so we have everyone put numbers on the, both sides of their vehicle so we can categorize things. And what are those like magnetic numbers that go on the car or something? Um, so there are a lot of different options with that. Some people do the magnets, some vehicles like Corvettes or things like that are fiberglass and the magnet won't stick to them so they use either vinyl or window paint um so that, and there's a wide gamut you can get the ones if it's your daily driver you probably don't want to drive to and from work monday morning with numbers up and down the side of your car so you might do the window paint or magnets some people might have a car that is their weekend toy or they use it just for this and they'll have permanent numbers, either paint or vinyl, that's just stuck right on the vehicle and they leave it on all the time. So it's at your discretion. There's a number of different ways that you can get the numbers generated. Um, and that's a question, depending on what your interest is on Saturday and Sunday, we can certainly help you get pointed in the direction of a vendor to help you out. Okay, well, do you have numbers? You know, since this is uh, my personal car, you know, it's a daily driver, right? Yep. Um, so you have, you have numbers that you would loan out there to put on the vehicle or some kind of marking? So for, paint? correct. For the novice school, we normally do is just do window paint because that'll come right off everyone's window um, and it'll be off by the end of the day if you don't want to drive home with it on. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, another question in the chat was about if we can stick GoPros inside of the vehicle. Um, GoPros are more than acceptable, any type of camera. Um, we just ask that they be securely mounted, either suction cup that's a good strength or um, permanently mounted, preferably with a tether, but we do not require a tether. If it comes out though, just be prepared for whatever damage results from it not being tethered. Right. Um, Quick question about um, yep. the length. So it starts at, we have to be there before 8.30. Um, and then how long does it go for? It's going to go until approximately, um, 
four thirty, five o'clock. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. And then, Linda, I'm not skipping over your question, just answering the one behind it right now. So we are running this evening. There's a school on Saturday through the BMW club. There's a school on Sunday for the mini clubs. So we're actually, they're two separate events, but since we're the organizer for both, we're handling this through one event. Um, and then back to Linda's question regarding the helmets. Um, if the helmet is too large when you get it, and I can't speak for wherever you bought it from, but I would, if it's too big, I would send it back. We have loaner helmets that are of small, of multiple sizes. So for the purposes of the school this weekend, we'll make sure that you have a helmet to wear and you're not just using one that doesn't fit because you couldn't get anything else on short notice. Quick logistics question for Saturday morning, Fraser. So the yes. map on the screen. So Correct. I guess we go through the through the big entrance where the heart is, and then you, the doors are open or the gates are open. You could just, just go straight for half a mile. So when you get to Summit Point, you're going to go to the main gate. At the main gate, you yeah. are going to have to sign the waiver for the facility in general. And then you'll let them know you're here for the autocross school on the Potomac circuit. The Potomac circuit is going to be a left turn out of the gate following the red line that's painted on the ground. And then you're going to get to a stop sign. You'll proceed through that stop sign, keep bending around as the road does in the blue line on the picture on the screen right now. And then there'll be a gate on the left hand side and we'll do our best to put signage out to say, turn in here, you've made it. Brilliant, thank you. Yep. There was a couple different waivers uh, that were mentioned. Yep. Uh, and the, li the link that I got in an email just kind of leads me to the, the base page of the CC mini site. Are all of those able to be taken care of that day? Um, if you are unable to sign any of the waivers electronically, we will have paper waivers on site in case okay. there was any technical difficulties. Okay. Yeah. It's the BMW one and uh, just leads me to the base side of the uh, of DC minis. So. Okay. Josh, if you bring up the uh, actual event discussion topic, I put the links in there since we're not sure what happened in that email. Okay, great. I'll give it a shot. That's helpful. All right. So there was a question about, is there an area to put up uh, a cover? Um, there will be some space off the surface if you want to set up a pop-up tent or something like that, just to keep your stuff out of the weather. Um, and then there was another question about the weather Saturday for those of you attending the BMW school it looks like we're going to be dealing with rain at least in the morning if not all day we run in the rain so dress accordingly if it's umbrellas if it's rain jackets whatever your comfort is bring it um umbrellas are okay to use while you're at the event and work in the facility or work in the course for later in the day when we're doing a, a full event just needs to be of a size and so you can hold it that it's not a problem with you seeing around and interfering with your vision or your ability to get out of the way should there be a car coming towards you. Um, we will have some space for people to stash things if they need to get them out of the rain. Um, and for future reference, if we have events that you're joining us with, we run rain or shine. Okay. Um, had a question again about the dates. Saturday is BMW, Sunday is Mini. Um, so whatever one you're registered for, stick to that date. And then there was another question about bringing people as guests. 
Um, guests are more than welcome if they want to come hang out. We just have to have them sign our waiver while they're on site. Hopefully, we'll be able to get them in the car for some ride-alongs that they'd like. And then if there is a need for food, um, we should have some ability to take care of them with what we're ordering for the group. If not, there is food on site at Summit Point um, in the main paddock area. There's burgers and chicken sandwiches and things like that. Nothing exceptionally fancy, but there is food available on site. All right, any other questions right now? All right, before we adjourn, just a couple of the things that Adam was touching on. He talked about understeer, he talked about oversteer. We're gonna have the access to a skid pad on both days. We're going to give you the opportunity to, to experience understeer for sure, hopefully get an oversteer going for everyone. Um, it is a wet skid pad, and you can expect that whatever car you bring is going to end up leaving dirtier than it came. So I wouldn't spend mm -hmm. tomorrow night detailing your car or anything like that because it will get dirty on whatever school day you are coming to. Um, and then again, weather dress appropriately um, for that. There's a question about tire pressures. I would recommend coming in a little bit higher than normal. Um, if you set your pressures normally to what's on the door jam, I'd go a couple pounds over that just for the purpose of the school because it's a lot easier to bleed air out than it is to add air at the facility. Um, and we can talk to you if you have further questions on Saturday about how to read the tires and what they're doing and how to set the optimal pressures going forward and what to look for. Tire pressure is going to be set for that temperature, that surface, that particular tire. So it's more about learning how to read the tire as a whole than necessarily picking a specific pressure. Um, other than that, we look forward to seeing everyone this weekend. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we start to wrap things up here? No, I just want to say super excited. Looking forward to it. Good. We're excited to host this for everyone. Thanks, Fraser. You're welcome. All right. If there are no further questions, you're going to get one more email from me before the event, just attaching the link to tonight's recording. Um, I'm gonna try and get you this, the slide deck as well from Adam. I'm definitely gonna be attaching this, where do you go when you enter the facility photo here. If anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to shoot us an email, um, info at nccautocross.com, or you can reply to any of the many, many emails that I'm sure have hit your inbox from me regarding autocross events. Um, with that, Adam, thank you for hosting tonight. Thank you for the presentation. And everyone who is here, thank you for attending. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank night. you. All right, everyone. Have a great evening. We'll see you this weekend.